All right, thank you to uh, an absolutely wonderful panel. And um, I just want to take a moment to, to thank all the panelists and moderators and all those that uh, did work um, to give us a, just a fabulous day from morning till now. Uh, and uh, you know, really a, a huge thank you to Karun himself for um, every single year uh, organizing a fabulous conference. So at this moment, at this moment, uh, the cake part of the conference is over. Now we're going to look at some fabulous icing, which is the the uh, celebration of uh, Dr. Andy Plump. And so with that, I'm going to hand off to the the next. Let's give a big hand to Mathai. Yeah. Thank you. Because people think this role of EMC is not easy. It's a lot of time commitment. So Mathai, once again, thank you. And here the best part starts for Andy. So I'm not going to be talking much, but we have five people who will talk on my behalf about you. So let's start with Chris Penko. Two minutes. So I will take it one and a half. All right, all right. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Benko. I'm the CEO of Connexa Health, and I've known Andy a long time. And uh, it's a pleasure to be asked to come up here and, and talk a little bit about him. Can I talk into this, please? No, that doesn't work. Um, one of the quotes about leadership and talent development that has stuck with me the most, and I don't know the attribution of it, um, but it's one of my absolute favorites. And it's, who believed in you before you believed in yourself? And who are you believing in now? I know for sure that I am one of many people in this room that has felt the energy of Andy Plump believing in them and their ability to, bake, to break boundaries beyond their own imagination. Uh, and that's one of my favorite things about you, Andy. And I know that because one of the great things about this meeting is getting to reconnect with colleagues that I've known from lots of different walks of life, from Merck, from Takeda. And I see so many people, particularly people who've been on your leadership team at Takeda who are here now, who had your encouragement, your support, your belief, and your energy, and they're CEOs of companies, they're chief medical officers of companies, and they're still friends with you and mostly with each other, um, which is a testament to how you've built and grown and developed leaders throughout your career. Um, I've also been fortunate to watch the evolution of your leadership team and how you continue to stretch people and grow people, push people and believe in them, to expand their boundaries of what they're capable of in support of Takeda's mission. The second thing that's been amazing to watch about you is how you do that on an organizational level. And I've observed that since you've been at Takeda. So I grew up at Merck, and I've known Andy since that time. I didn't work with him at Sanofi, but I know that company well. And I've often commented to you and your team that your perspective from being at two big global pharmas was incredibly important to your leadership at Takeda. But I know damn well you did not learn a lot of the things that you do at either of those two companies. It was a privilege in 2015 when you invited me to be one of your advisors as you were taking on the leadership role at Takeda and I was spinning Conexa out of Merck. Um, what Andy says to his team when he brings in advisors, particularly people who have known him a long time, is that we're there to tell him when he's full of shit. And I really do enjoy that, perhaps not as much as Sam does, but I really do enjoy getting to tell him that he's full of shit. What I appreciate is the number of times you've proven me wrong. You've tried to stretch the organization in ways that are beyond its boundaries and comfort zone and things that you may have never seen before and none of us have ever seen before, but you've made them happen. You've had a relentless focus on narrowing your therapeutic areas and making sure Takeda is getting drugs to patients. And under your watch, we've watched that happen. We've watched medicines get advanced, get registered, and get to patients, which is the most important thing we can do in this business. But at the same time, you've also set the stage for a very long-term future for the company, much like the predecessors before you at Takeda. So expanding the modalities, expanding the partnerships, expanding the mindset of Takeda to be more open to different types of innovation, to have a different attitude toward risk, has fundamentally shifted the culture of the company. So I don't know if George is still here. Takeda is not quite as old as Harvard. It's only like 240 years old. But watching what you and the leadership team have done in the last 10 years has been absolutely tremendous. So it's been an honor and a privilege to work with you and to call you a friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
May I request uh, Colleen if she's here? Andy, you need to sit there. It's your chair. Yeah. Absolutely. Please. Don't freak out. I've timed it. You, you did say two to three minutes. I got it. It has been my honor to work alongside Andy for the past seven years, witnessing firsthand his remarkable leadership at Takeda. Behind the brilliant scientist lies an exceptional human being. Andy is a deeply caring mentor and a champion of people. He creates an environment where everyone feels valued, empowered, and capable of contributing. He believes in the possible, and he encourages all of us to follow his lead. Andy's dedication to continuous learning extends beyond scientific advancements. He is a passionate advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. A number of years ago, he had a defining moment that made him realize he could, and in fact should, do more for underrepresented groups and drive a culture where people can be their authentic selves. Since then, he has worked extensively to improve both his understanding of DEI and how best to embed those strategies into the foundation of our organization. These efforts to increase DEI and representation in the workforce extend to the next generation of STEM leaders. We see him walk the walk in his role as an engaged board member of the Biomedical Science Careers Program, many of whom we have scholars here in the room today, and I hope that you have had the benefit of interacting with them. Andy is keenly aware of the importance of nurturing talent, as Chris mentioned. And over the years, former colleagues who have worked for Andy have taken flight as leaders in their own right, becoming luminaries at the forefront of our scientific ecosystem. They have the confidence to push boundaries. They take chances and pursue their ambitious goals because of Andy, and many of them showed up today to support him. And finally, beyond his kindness, humor, and intellect, Andy possesses a rare quality for such a brilliant mind, empathy. He genuinely connects with people, understanding their needs, and encourages their aspirations, whether they're an early career colleague at the bench, or his senior leadership team in the boardroom. This creates a powerful combination, a leader who is both insightful and profoundly human. Andrew, your contributions to Takeda, to science, and to the lives of those around you are truly admirable. You're an inspiration, and we're all incredibly fortunate to have you as our leader. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Elias? Yeah, I was going to say no hug for Chris. You surprised me. Usually, you, with a name that starts with Z, I go last. <laughs> so, so uh, Andy, it's really a pleasure to be here and honor you. And, and it's a privilege because it's a privilege to have known you. And uh, frankly, you're one of my dearest colleagues and one of the most endearing, really. And I, I was ju you just heard what people said about him, right? All the things you said about him going from working with Mark tessier Lavigne in his lab and then at Merck in head cardiovascular research, then at Sanofi, he learned what not to do. That's why he's so successful at Takeda, you know? So we taught you, we taught you what not to do. And, and you learn from that, but just uh, jokes apart, let me say something about why he is successful. We met actually in the, in the train station. I had his name out of 10 names uh, to recruit for Chris uh, as head of research, vice president, and, and he was you know, at Merck in New Jersey, I guess, and, and, and uh, I said, look, I don't have a lot of time, I'm coming through, let's meet. Where? Uh, well, 
what about the train station? <laughs> so, so we met at the train station in, in Baltimore, I think, and we had a great conversation. And I was blown away because he could explain things uh, with wit. You know, when somebody has wit, it's more than just intelligence. The intelligence, the ability to connect contrarian ideas in one sentence, and you get, like, surprised. So profound intelligence, depth, wit, humor, and um, also good judgment. So I'll tell you a little story about good judgment. So, you know, he came. He had a cardiovascular experience. And at Sanofi, we created a, um, a side venture called Sunrise, which was to really partner with emerging companies. And Chris allowed that <laughs> against the board's, uh, <laughs> board's approval. But we did it. And one of the first venture was Warp Drive with uh, Greg Verdine. You know that, you're with Greg now. <clears throat> and another one was myocardia. So myocardia came because we weren't sure to stay in cardiovascular. We were developing PCSK9, so we said, well, it's not going to be enough. We, we, we need something else. And, um, and he basically convinced me how. I wasn't convinced because myocardia was talking about essentially genetic forms of cardiomyopathy, you know, dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then he said, no, no, you, you really need to listen to that because it's human genetically driven. And I said, okay, well, let's go meet them. And then when we met them was Jim Spudich. And he was the originator of the structure of myosin and acting. Okay, so it wasn't like going to second, third tier knowledge. So one of the things I found out about him, he goes to the origin of the, of the science. He doesn't really take it second hand. The second thing was John and Cricket Seidman who were the, um, the, the, the geneticists who found these categories of patients that were genetically abnormal and had these cardiomyopathies. And we went, if you remember, he, he came to me and said, don't miss that one, Elias, it's a good one. <laughs> I remember that. You know, he said, it's, it's human genetics, it's Jim, it's John. And we did it. And we did it, and it, it worked, and so well, but then, what happened later was that Sanofi lost heart after we left and got rid of it and by BMS bought it for $13 billion. So that's him. He has that nose and that instinct. And the nose is actually more important than you think because he decided to come and live in Paris. He brought his family and uh, your son went to uh, a local, he's a great, he has mathematics uh, skills, I know. And uh, he, he came to Paris. And I said, well, that's great. That's dedication. You know, he's coming to the headquarters and so on. And so on. But you know what it was? He loves wine. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me that's not true. This guy is one of the most knowledgeable French wine lover I know. And I tell you, he, is, he has the technique. He's got the skills. And I followed him. So we had great wine when he was in Paris. <laughs> so with that, I want to really uh, thank you for all your leadership, what you've done for this organization. I've been coming here many, many times. And without you, I think it wouldn't have shined with the humor and the wit that you always bring to everything you do. Thank you, Andy. Oh. Chris, I guess surprised you were briefed. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Karun. <laughs> so, Matai, just get ready. In 10 years, that's you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just uh, echo a lot of things that, that Elias said uh, because after you met. Andy in the train station, then, then I had a chance to, to meet with, uh, with Andy. And, you know, we were trying to rebuild, uh, basically, research and development. Uh, you know, when Elias and I got there, um, the last drug that Sanofi had come up with was, was Plavix, and, and that had been 20 years early. And, and so we really had to, to, to restart everything. We had, I don't know, 10,000 people in R&D. Uh, 16,000. I lost count after a while. <clears throat> and and how, what do you do with that? You know, you've got to 
You got a company that hasn't come up with a new drug in, in 20 years. Uh, you got 16,000 people, most of whom are lifetime employees under French law. Um, and so we had to, we had to really uh, get something going entrepreneurially. And you know, part of that uh, was coming to Boston and, and acquiring Genzyme. But a lot of it was the Sunrise projects. And, and then figuring out how do you find talent within the organization and start creating some programs. You know, most, most times, you know, large companies, you've already got uh, pipelines, everything is, is, is all set. You know, you come in and you tweak it. Um, but you had to be an entrepreneur. Um, you had to actually be a, a, your own startup. Um, and, and I tell you, startup is a whole lot easier with five people than with, with thousands of people. And, and you did that. And again, you did that with, um, with, with such grace. Um, and and uh, you know, one of the things that Elias taught me is people who really understand something can explain it simply. And I'm not a scientist. I always like to say my three-letter degree is not PhD, it's CPA. Um, and Andy could always make me understand uh, what we're doing. And I used to come and sit in, in the research presentations and I could actually understand it. And, and you could see the passion and enthusiasm that, that Andy created. And, and, you know, considering, like I said, what we started with, that takes real leadership. And so um, I'm not surprised how successful you've been at, at, um, at Takeda. And I'd also congratulate Andy, you know, because he's very involved with the community. Um, we see uh, Andy and his wife at the Boston Ballet. He's been very involved um, with the Boston Symphony. There's the Christmas concert for uh, companies every year, and Andy has, has chaired that. So, uh, you know, to the point that was made earlier, you're, you're not only a man of, of, of brain, but a man of heart, and, and I have a great respect for that and a great uh, affection for that, too. So uh, thanks for all that you've done for the USAIC. Thank you. Well said, Chris. Mark? He's come all the way from California <laughs> for his student. Well, I'm delighted of, to add my voice to the chorus of praise for Andy that you've heard from the other speakers. And I'm going to also echo and, and amplify and extend a little bit um, what you've heard from them uh, by sharing a personal story of my first encounter uh, with Andy. Um, I, I met Andy about 25 years ago. Um, at the time he'd finished his MD and his PhD, he was at UCSF uh, doing his fellowship and as part of that uh, he was looking for a place to do a postdoc and he emailed me um, to uh, inquire about postdoc opportunities. At the time, my lab was full. I just accepted a bunch of other postdocs, and so I didn't even meet with him. I wrote back to him and say, I'm terribly sorry, but my lab is full. Um, well, Andy wrote back, and I don't have the original email, but uh, it won't surprise you that something in what he, he wrote disarmed me and made me agree to, um, uh, to meet with him. Andy has a way of opening doors that are shut, and he did that in the, the, the venue of an email. So, and of course, once he walked into my office, I was a sitting duck. Um, because uh, once you've met Andy, you just become so compelled by him that it's impossible not to want to have him on your team. Uh, and so I accepted him. And in fact, I, all I could think of was, oh my god, I can't believe that I almost didn't meet with this guy. And I might have turned him down. Um, so what is it that changed my mind? And it was really in the blink of an eye. Um, there's his brilliance, of course, that has been, been commented on. He, he came well prepared, he'd read our work, he had lots of great ideas, we had an engaging conversation, but it was much more than that. There was also a deep humanity to him, and also, as Colleen said, uh, the empathy that came across really in that, that first meeting uh, as well. And then, and this has also been commented on, it's a common uh, uh, strand, his humor. Uh, meeting, you know, meeting with Andy is not just always interesting, it's always fun. He, Andy has the greatest gift of anyone I know to be able to toggle back and forth between humor and seriousness and to be able to use humor to leaven difficult situations and circumstances but without ever um, uh, trivializing things um, or downplaying things. He really uh, uses it, it just makes you feel better and it draws you in and it's part of the way that he solves problems and engages with people. 
Um, so he joined my lab, and then I discovered there was even much more than that, because, um, because of his magnetic personality and also his generosity of spirit, he made everybody else in the lab better. He has that effect on people, bringing out the best in people, uh, and made my lab uh, better as a result. Also, I discovered that uh, Andy shines not just in the moment, as he did when he walked into my office, but also in the long term. He plays the long game. He has that patience and persistence to go at things and not let up. And, and uh, finally, uh, what became very clear is just how much Andy cares about others. Uh, he cares, of course, about, his, about Suzanne and his beautiful family. He cares about his friends. He cares about his colleagues. But just as much he cares about people he's never met people who are suffering from disease and that he wants to help. The, most of the postdocs in my lab, when they finished, uh, were set on going to academia. That was their driver. They wanted to run an academic lab and do science. That isn't, wasn't Andy's starting point. Andy's starting point was he wanted to um, take a career path that would help him, uh, uh, that would enable him to help people the most. And so academia was an option. Uh, industry was an option. Um, but he determined correctly that actually the path of industry would enable him to have the biggest multiplier effect. And you heard earlier today about this wasn't always welcome. It was a time when, when people, his PhD mentor, frowned upon that kind of thing. So it was a courageous act on his part to give up what was going to be a brilliant academic career to say, no, I'm going to go to, to industry. And it was because he cared about wanting to help people as much as possible. So you heard how he went to Merck, then Sanofi, then Takeda. Over the years, Andy and I kept in touch. Uh, he would call me occasionally for advice. Uh, we'd have uh, nice conversations. But as you know, within a few years, um, we started out as mentor and mentee, but we rapidly became peers. And I found that I was calling him uh, as much, if not more, uh, for his advice. And Andy's always been generous with his advice um, and, uh, um, uh, and his support over the years. And it's something for which I'm personally grateful um, as well. Um, at the core, um, today, Andy is the same uh, as uh, the, the person who walked into my office that day. Smart, whip smart, strategic, driven, driven to do good, but also kind and generous and empathetic and authentic, uh, and also with this wonderful blend of humor and determination. Andy, you're an extraordinary leader and a huge contributor to advancing medicine for the benefit of those in need. So it's with great pleasure um, uh, for me to have the opportunity to present to you the Distinguished Service Award of USAIC, which reads, for his vision and longstanding deep commitment to catalyzing industry academic partnerships, interdisciplinary translational biomedical research and development, and innovation-based solutions for a healthier world, and I might add, for being the wonderful human being that you are, Andy. Please join me for the presentation. I know. Bill, Bill you, you received an award. And you can imagine what this is like, so. Well, I do have notes, so I'm, I'm not usually at a loss for words, but I feel like I would have been had I not had these notes. Um, well, firstly, uh, thank you very much you know, to, to all of you, especially to those who just had just amazing comments. Chris, Colleen, at least Rison was supposed to be here, but um, sick, she got sick. Um, Elias, Chris, Mark, uh, just, um, I'm blown away, and I don't know what to say, and I'm wondering if Sam Waxall is here and can come up and make the comments for me. <laughs> He's not even here, is he? Okay. He's a nutcase, isn't he? <laughs> I also, um, uh, you know, in the, in the interest of going toggling back and forth, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative for all of you staying in the room, but I've been told that, um, that the, the, the bar won't open until after I finish my comments. So I don't know if you're here for me or because there's just no other choice. Um, Karun, I can't thank you enough. This is, of course, um, this everything here, this, this is you, this absolutely. Karun has given me the history, this a Moser piece of art. 
and um, it's, it was handcrafted and it's quite, quite unique and so I can't, I can't thank you enough. I also can't thank you enough for humoring me because when Karun, when Karun approached me maybe six months ago, or it was actually even longer ago actually, this has in, been in the works for quite some time, he offered me a, a lifetime achievement award and I kind of cringed for a second thinking of everyone I've known who, who's won the Lifetime Achievement Award, and I, I instantly go to the Oscars, and you know, the octogenarians win the <laughs> Lifetime Achievement Award, and so that became the Distinguished uh, Service Award, which I, I really appreciate because I feel like I still have a lifetime ahead of me um, to give. So, um, so I'm so deeply appreciative, I'm so humbled, and actually very embarrassed in, in a sense because I think you know, for so much of what we do in, in this world, it's not about an individual achievement, it's about the team. And um, I'm also the middle child of five. And so I tend to be lost in the shuffle, and I really like that. I, I don't mind being out there and pushing for what I believe in, but um, having the spotlight shine on me like this is just, uh, is just not, that, not that comfortable. So there's a sense of embarrassment um, that's here. Um, also, uh, um, and, and several people in the room, I'm looking at you, Matai, plans, you'll learn this over time, Jane, others. As an R&D head in our industry, um, the, spotlight, the spotlight is often on us, but uh, it's not to thank us for achievements. <laughs> it's, typically, it's typically to either blame us or to fire us. That's kind of what happens to us. And so as an R&D head in our industry, this is a, a really um, special um, moment. You know, the, the, the five people that just um, spoke and had just amazing things to say. They've all been um, incredible um, influences in, in my life. And um, I was thinking Najat's panel was about you know, machine learning and AI, and I've learned a terminology about large language models, which is grounding. So these models are grounded on a certain data set. So I thought it might be helpful if I could ground you in, in my life. Right, so I've already shared that I'm the middle child of, of five. That probably tells you a lot. So you're like, oh, that explains it. Um, I've also been this, this ferociously curious person. And I, it dates back, Colleen and I were talking about this recently. It dates back to my childhood when um, maybe three and a half or four years old, my dad, who passed away a couple of years, and he just would have been so, so proud of this moment. And it's not just because of the moment, it's because no matter what I did, he was so proud. It was, and I miss him. Um, and, and maybe the reason I'm so driven is because he made it easy, no matter what I would do. My mom was tougher. <laughs> Get a 99 on an algebra test, and I'd come home, and my mom would say, of course, where was that other point? So, um, but you know, when I was a kid, I, uh, three and a half, I remember my, a very famous story in my family, my dad said, that I came up to him once because I would just question after question after question. And I had the epiphany that, you know, Dad, if I had someone in the room with me for a weekend and I could ask every question I had, I wouldn't be able to ask enough questions. So my dad laughed at that. My mom, on the other hand, because I was one of five and she was quite busy, she was at home with us, um, I would just be bothering her. She loved her gardening. and I would be tracking her, asking her questions after questions after questions. And so she accelerated my entrance into preschool. Andrew. You need to go to preschool. Um, so so I, I did well enough in, in school to go to a great college. I went to MIT. Um, I was a bit o over my head, to be frank, actually. It was just an amazing institution. I figured out after a year how to manage and, 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 and work through MIT, and I ended up doing well enough to go to UCSF, to go to Rockefeller for graduate school. But it wasn't together. I made the decision later in life to train. Um, and then. From there, I went, um, I went to, to, to medical school. I'm sorry, I went to, I went to do my residency at UCSF, but, I, but I, needed to have, I needed to have science. I had gotten so addicted to science at the point that I wanted to train clinically, but I needed to have a path into science. So I actually called David Baltimore one day. I don't know, Mark, if I ever told you this, but uh, I called David Baltimore while I was on my fourth year rotation in medical school in surgery. I was doing surgery. And I said, and, and he picked up the phone. I wasn't expecting him to pick up the phone. I was expecting to make an appointment. So I stumbled and I said, you know, I'm looking for a postdoc. And I had gotten to know him through my earlier period. And, you know, right then and there, he accepted me for a postdoc. He was at MIT at the time. And then in the intervening three years, I did this three and a half years in advance planning. 
in the intervening three years, he left to go to Caltech to become president. And so that just didn't seem the right move for me. My wife was in graduate school at the time. And so that's when I started to think of as quickly as possible getting into a lab locally in the Bay Area. So I looked at Berkeley, I looked at UCSF, I looked at Stanford, and I read and I read and I read. And I really fell in love with um, the work that Mark was doing because Mark took this just incredibly complex set of processes, axon guidance in the developing nerv nervous system and distilled them down to two basic principles. And it made, it, made some complexity so simple and I fell in love with it. And so I just couldn't imagine why you wouldn't want me. And so I, don't, I didn't ever pick up, you said the lab was full, but I didn't really hear that in the email. So I wouldn't let him not take me. And I just had an amazing time in Mark's lab. It was one of the most um, scientifically rigorous, disciplined, amazing experiences of, of my life. And I learned so much. Um, but as I worked my way to the end of the lab, while I, I loved what I was doing, at heart, I was a physician scientist, and I was having trouble finding a way to get back into, um, into this, this space. And so um, through an odd sequence of events, I end up at Merck, and that's where I got to know um, Chris Benko. And we became very close very, very quickly, and you know, Chris was a mentor of mine, and Chris saw me f stumble and make mistakes left and right and, and learn through those mistakes. Um, and later, when I eventually came to, when knew I was coming to Takeda, the first person I called and I said, I want you to join the team. And he said, I, I'm just starting this company, Conexa. So that's when Chris agreed to, to become an advisor and, to, and I made him promise at the time, as he said, to call me out whenever I was um, getting too comfortable with myself. And he's been really wonderful at, at doing that. So I had my career at Merck and I learned, I mean, so many of you have, have been through that institution, Mike, so many of you. Um, it was just incredible. It was a little bit kind of on the, on the kind of dipping from its greatness of, of the Roy Vagelis era, but it was still an amazing institution of great people. I learned so much. Um, and then about 10, 10 years in, 11 years in, I got a, a, Mark and I actually were at a party together. Jeff Friedman's daughters were getting B'nai Mitzvah, but not Mitzvah. And uh, it was so loud that, and Mark was talking to me. I hadn't seen him in a while and I agreed and what I was agreeing, I didn't realize what I was agreeing to, and you said you'd send me something the next day, it was actually a position that Mark was helping Francis Collins re recruit for at the NIH. It was just starting NCATS. And I didn't realize it, so I had agreed to apply for this position. I wasn't looking for a job. I really didn't hear what you were saying. So anyway, you had to write this white paper of what you would do, and, and, and I looked online what they were planning, and it looked like pretty stupid to be frank. So I, write, write, I wrote a white paper that said, I wouldn't do any of what you're doing, this is what I would do. Because you know, I'm not gonna get this job. I go down for the interview, I'm on the Excella, and uh, thinking about all the interview questions, Chris was a great mentor of mine, he's like, you gotta prepare for the interview. And I was thinking of all the interview questions, and um, you know, and I, I didn't really expect to get the job or really want the job, and so you're very comfortable. It was a group interview with 15 people. It could have been quite intimidating if I wanted the job. Um, and went around the table, asked all the questions that I had prepared for, and I was like, wow, I thought of that one, I thought of this one. Finally, we got to, I don't remember who was running the NINDS at the time. It was a woman a scientist, so I can't remember. And she asked, okay, let's say three years into the job, you get in front of Congress and they ask you, we, we've given you $5 billion over the last three years, what do you have to show for it? And I was stumped, so I, I don't know. And I thought, well, you know, running a translational institute that's really gonna help make medicines for patients, I bet I'm gonna have an easier time than you're gonna have. <laughs> so that was my wit playing out. Um, so despite that comment, that rate limiting career comment, I um, was offered the position. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just wasn't ready to go and to become a you know, public servant in the, at the NIH. And a week later, Elias called and had this amazing position at Sanofi for me. And, and, and in that intervening week, I realized that I was ready for something, something new. And just as fate would have it, I, from one NIH director to another. And so Elias gave me this just incredible opportunity to come to Sanofi as head of research. And it was just an amazing step function for me in terms of responsibility, um, the cultural adaptation to working in a truly international company and learning and, and from you, Elias, I learned so much from you. Um, and of course, that's where I got to know, to know Chris. And you, you say your d degree, three letters, CFA,
but y you are the face of innovation really in, in Boston now, Chris. And you know, even then as a, as, a, as a financial genius and a CEO of a company, you really understood innovation and how to engage at the right level and motivate us. Um, it was wonderful. You also were an incredibly inspirational speaker. And I can recall one um, leadership meeting, the top 50, where we were sitting there and you had helped to navigate with Elias and your team. This is before I came. Um, Sanofi from a, a $10 billion um, exclusivity cliff. And you had helped to maintain growth through this period without a major acquisition, without a major, I mean, nothing that typically was done in pharma was really brilliant. And you were gathering us together to uh, help think through what we would do next. And you used this analogy and you had seen this trailer for the perfect storm. And you're like, you know the perfect storm? I had seen it and I had read the book. The boat's going in and the wave is coming and, and then the trailer ends. And then your, your take, because it's an American movie, is then the boat gets through the wave and is on the other side and has to navigate now fresh waters. Well, I don't know any, if any of you know the story, but the boat capsizes and everybody dies. <laughs> so, the, so the next week I bought him the DVD and uh, su suggested that before he uses that analogy again that, that he read the book. And, uh, and so, and so then, then, you know, it was in November of 2014 that I, I'd, I'd gotten pulled into looking at this job that I'm in now that I didn't think I was qualified for and I, I, didn't, I didn't know, I didn't want. I was very committed to, to Elias and to the mission that we had at, at uh, Sanofi and to, to Chris, of course. And I was actually getting ready to pull out from my final interview in Tokyo with Christoph Weber, our CEO and the board. And that was that week that Chris, you left, you left Sanofi and I knew that things were just not going to be the same. And I, and I continued forward, I got the offer. And to be frank, you know, and I, and I feel quite bad about this, I left too early. I didn't finish what we had started at Sanofi. Um, you know, oh, but on the other hand, I felt like this was too good of an opportunity to, to turn down. And I think, I think in the end, the, you know, the fact that you know, I'm the second most tenured R&D head in the industry after Michael Dolston, I think says a lot. A lot about the company I'm in, a lot about the CEO, a lot about the team that I've had a chance to work with. And of course, Colleen, who spoke has been with me for almost this entire journey. And, you know, the, the, it's hard to ever declare success and we have so much we have to do. There's so many challenges that we all face, but we've made huge strides in really evolving a, a, a Japanese national company to a truly, to a truly multinational company. And the, you know, the statistics speak to it in, in, in for the company broadly, but also for R&D. We were, 10% um, of our company was in Boston now, of our R&D organization was in Boston now, almost 75% is in, is in Boston. Um, our R&D budgets doubled, the number of R&D employees has doubled, not that size is always a good thing, but they're just indicators of the significant changes that, that we've made. And then my last comments, and then, then everybody can go and get their drinks are, um, US, USAIC, it's just been such a privilege, Karun, to be part of this group. And I've been with this group, I don't know, 12 years, 13 years, 14 years. And emceeing for, okay, seven years. Because I had one year where I couldn't do it and then this year, yeah. And it's just been fantastic to watch the evolution of this group and, um, and in many ways. And I'll, I'll, I noticed one because there are very few people in this room now wearing ties. I, there are very few people in this room not wearing ties. And when, in, maybe 10 years ago, everybody was wearing a tie. And there were two reasons for that. Okay, one was that it was a very formal set of interactions. And the other was that it was mostly male. And I think two things that have happened, and they're related to one another to some extent, is that we've really diversified the group. And that diversification has really led to a much more uh, uh, elevated and enhanced um, dialogue. And I think you see it in the way that the conversations happen. It's, it's gone from a, more of a monologue to more of a, a, a really provocative set of, um, set of important discussions that have to happen. And then the last piece, of course, is India. We often forget about India in our business. It's the, it's the largest democracy. Almost 20% of the world lives in India. It's the fifth largest economy in the world. Predictions are that by the end of the decade, it'll be the third largest economy, but it's vastly underrepresented in the number of clinical trials that are run in India, and the amount of innovation. Given there was an article in Nature, I don't know if people saw this last week, about 
India, the, the elections are coming up. They're, it's a weird election system. It's like two months of elections. It's a marathon. But they're talking about the fact that whoever wins, they're inheriting a country that ha that's, that's poised for greatness in technology and science. And I think that the, the group is always focused on India. The way we're doing it now and the way that we're engaging everybody in that dialogue, I think, is something we should all be very, um, very proud of. So with that, I just can't thank you all enough, and especially um, you, Karun, so thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That was really great, Mark. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah.